Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our regular Monday stream. We are indeed back. We're back. We are very much back. <laughs> um, you might notice the audio's not in stereo. We're not doing that again. Um, we just thought we'd try it. We're, we're attempting some different settings to try and make sure we get a bit less background noise because some of the, I don't know what it's been, with Windows audio seems to, be, uh, seems to be a bit egregious at just changing level constantly. Yep. Um, so I have noticed a few things creeping into our streams here and there in terms of background noise or desk noise or whatever. So I'm trying to keep that to a minimum. Um, I should probably leave the thumbnail on screen. I just realized I had the uh, thing on there. But um, yes, uh, before we do too much shilling, um, <coughs> the weather's still not great. <laughs> it's, it's No, I mean, it looks all right out there just now, but it's, uh, it's rather windy and probably nowhere near as um, no one near as it's nowhere near as rainy as it's been anyway. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Though. Yes. Um, it's it's not raining at least now anyway. Um, so we'll 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 see what we can uh, we can muster up in terms of weather reports. I don't know. It's just kind of all been the same. Yep. Um, if you do want to support the channel, we are still monetized on YouTube. You'll probably see all the buttons there still. Um, just just double check. Just double check. Yes, we are. Um, not, I don't think I've forgotten to put it on for a stream in quite a while, but I, I have done in the past, so I'm always paranoid about that. Uh, if you want to donate to us without a cut being taken, uh, the best way to do that is the Ko-Fi link. Yep. Um, and we also have the Substack as well. We've been putting out a lot more stuff on both the Substack and on the YouTube. Uh, the Substack is a good way to support us because you get the streams the next day as an audio podcast to listen yes. to your leisure, and you also get all the associated research notes. Um, but there are, at the moment, there's been two kind of original pieces of writing coming out a week because you've still been doing your mantras um, for surviving modernity yeah. and also the infinite. Uh, I've been doing kind of infinite stuff. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been doing... It seems maybe monthly, maybe bi-weekly. I'm trying to figure out how I can get these out in some timely fashion because a bit longer. There are written pieces here as well, so there's plenty to go at on the Substack. And also we've been uploading a bit more in terms of YouTube videos. There's all there's kind of video versions of some of the older Substack stuff. And also I've been doing a few stream clips, although YouTube mm -hmm. seems to keep trying to post those at really funny times. Because it doesn't seem to, it seems to forget what time zone we're in if I use any kind of VPN. Of course it does. Um, so it actually set that to go out like at 7 a.m. That's why nobody's seen it. And also it has a weird recommended Chinese videos because the time zone it came out oh, in. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very funny. Are we in the Weibo feeds? Yes, the infinite Substack article. But again, there's we've got uh, all the links down below. I should probably put the... Uh, like a little, I've also set up a link tree thing or whatever it's called with all the stuff on it too to make it a bit easier because people have had trouble following kind of our backup platforms and things like that. Yeah, it's just, it's the nature of the internet nowadays that you need to be in about 15 different places singing and dancing all at the same time, which is quite frankly a massive pain in the fucking arse. It's a, it's a, <laughs> it is a giant pain. It is not very pleasant to have to have so many backup platforms and alternate routes and bits and pieces, and we're going to put the written place in one it, place, it written is, stuff in one place, and video stuff in another place. It's actually amazing when you look at it from a sort of wider perspective, the amount of work that the two of us have to put into to make even a very, very <laughs> meagre YouTube and Substack page even somewhat worthwhile doing. Yeah. I, I don't mean that to be the complete and utter black pillar, but without either large amounts of momentum behind you in terms of scale or otherwise support, it becomes almost really impossible and a bit of a fool's investment. It is only really, I think, the growing support from people in the last year or so, both in terms of sharing stuff and also, quite frankly, monetary support. It's really meant that we've hung on with doing this stuff. I think we enjoy it ourselves, but if it wasn't somewhat benefiting us in the way that it was you might be expecting a stream every two weeks if you were lucky <laughs> possibly it, it is it is quite hard to be on the the content treadmill as it were um basically i'm trying to make sure there's something going out on some platform basically every day of the week um well five days a week i suppose and give people the weekends off 
but it is it is, we do have some kind of of residual notoriety from other places so that helps us with what we do but if you're somebody who's who's starting out on this there really is no pathway into having some well, kind of audience this is why i frankly just told people that ask me you know how do we get how do i get involved in this stuff don't yeah the the real answer is don't um <laughs> it is frankly for most people not worth it and you'll encounter a lot of people who basically just waste your time as well but it's we we soldier on um because we're not really we're not suffering here it's just uh it's just a case of this does take a, a quite a large time investment and it is quite difficult to maintain the output that, but we that we do but today we'll just be discussing something that it does seem to be sporadic talk about yes but only really post kind of 2018 2019 uh, i'm not so sure i think this is actually something that's been it's been a constant elite issue it's just always never really been at the forefront oh it's never really it's only breached the news cycle recently because as we'll see a lot of this stuff is a bit i don't know higgledy piggled in its timeline because it seems some people still have the old narrative i saw something in chat Unfortunately, the YouTube chat basically blanks itself when you start, mm. which is kind of annoying because you don't see the pre-chat stuff. But somebody in chat said they had to talk to somebody recently who still thought it was the opposite, and that's usually true. A lot of people, oh, there'll be 10 million people in 20 years, and that's just, that's not the case. Yes. In fact, as we'll get into, in many instances, populations are already falling. Um, well, you, you've got a little note here for the start of the stream. In the face of ever-growing demands on housing and infrastructure, why are politicians in Western nations maximizing immigration as much as humanly possible with mass uh, mass visa entry schemes? The real answer is they face the loss of control that would, res would result in a reversal of the revolution of mass and scale with traditional demographics still in place. It would be akin to the social upheaval after the plague. Or after the Black Death, you've got there, sorry. This That's is why we thing, have yeah. the focus on integration and not the total numbers. The plan is to maximise numbers no matter what, and especially maximise the number of people who are engaged with the managerial system. Yes, as a preamble, I will say that we're kind of assuming for this that you understand some processes that happened during the 1960s with the, kind of the simultaneous installation of birth control regimes in the entire Western world within a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> sort of maybe two points to sort of go over before we really dive in as well is that this isn't us coming at this from like a ooh the the globalists are evil because they think about population metrics it's one of the most primary i think factors in regards to ruling in general is the management of the health quality and quantity of the people you rule over yes i mean this is something kings always had to worry about this is something that later rulers had to worry about and this is something that rulers still have to worry about today they just frame the way they discuss it quite differently and especially in an instance nowadays whereby the whole sort of inflation-based economy really only works with an increasing population because you need say so you have eight to ten percent inflation every year in terms of just raw money printing you then, to some extent, need a roughly similar growth in population to sort of soak that inflation up over time. Um, Gears also pointed out uh, while we were off air that the clip art I've got is a bit weird because the foot's like wrong. It's like a left foot. No, it's not. The legs are crossed. <laughs> oh, the legs are crossed. Okay, that makes sense. Ah, it's just a really unclear. To be fair, a lot of what we use in our thumbnails is like free clip art. Yeah. And like public domain images. I'm slightly autistic about using stuff that isn't copyrighted a lot of the time. Yeah, because someone in chat there's a population is only falling in the West. This isn't necessarily true. And we'll try and go through because some I, of the misconceptions people might I have. I will on preface this. this by saying that there are countries that have a strong incentive, like Britain, to understate their population numbers, especially when it comes to population due to immigration. I'd say throughout Europe, the population numbers and the fertility rate numbers are not reliable in a kind of downward direction. No. Um, but I would say that the numbers in China and India are not reliable in an upward direction, in that China and India, because of the type of power that they wield, are incentivized to exaggerate their populations, yes. as are certain parts of South America, 
as are certain other countries. And as we'll see throughout all of this, um, we have to rely on the numbers we've got. And, and when we kind of did a deep dive into the numbers in Britain, the numbers in Britain are, are deeply wrong, mm. possibly by even as much as 30% in a lot of places. The population of Europe due to immigration is a lot higher than we think it is. I think the population of many parts of Africa is higher due to just logistics of not being able to count it. So do take all of the statistics here and, and think about this with a pinch of globalist salt. We are relying on their numbers and where possible we will provide commentary where we think they are not accurate, but we are accepting part of the framing here which could be false. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of... I mean, we can maybe click on this first article you've got here. There has been so many different attempts at framing this. Populations going up, that's a good thing. Populations going up, that's a bad thing. Populations going down, that's a good thing. Populations going down, that's a bad thing. So like, all four of these possibilities are kind of all simultaneously happening and, and being argued about all at the so same time. The large thing that's never commented on, and I'll come back to it in the conclusions, is the fact that populations need to be stable. That is a, over a long period, populations need to be stable. And that is the thing that made Europe how it is. It's the thing that made a lot of you know, countries that managed to make it out of the subsistence level and into being civilizations. They all had relatively stable, slow growth in many cases, or even kind of uh, just above water in some cases, population levels. But a, the rate of change is very important, and it's something that isn't really considered in any of these. And I know you talked about managerialism and being good custodians of the population. But it's very clear that over the past 100 years, they have been very bad custodians because they've created perverse incentives in some places, and they have initiated rapid change uh, in a system kind of, of, of human development yeah. that, that is... The opposite in terms of requirements. Well, pre pre technology, <laughs> yeah. or at least pre technology as we have it today, one would expect that a population as it as it grew on a sort of steady rate would also essentially trim and pair off unhealthy aspects of the livestock. As it were, you know, if you think about a herd of cows and keeping yeah. that herd of cows going for 10, 15, 20, so on and so forth through next generations, you don't breed the ones that are unhealthy. And yeah. this is something that used to sort of just naturally happen as it's sort of a natural occurrence, uh, what we'd refer to it as, a, oh, as a word, natural selection, that's the one. Yes. So it's not even necessarily just a case that the numbers are different nowadays, but they've almost completely thrown any notion of quality or trimming the fat as it were out of the equation as well well the issue is that all talk of kind of breeding stock and things like that or population management in overt rather than covert sense is all regarded as eugenics mm. we'll get onto that but there has very much been population management whilst pretending there hasn't been population yes. management but the article here is from The Guardian. This is from 2023. This year, world population bomb may never go off as feared, the study finds. One, this is built through the framing of the fact that we've been told up until now, basically, in most cases, that the population is in inexorable rise and we all need to be good citizens and have less children to stop the world getting overcrowded. That has been the narrative even when this has been revealed to be patently false, as it has been really since about the 60s, if you look at the trajectories that nations go through, it's been very obvious since the West's experiments with kind of contraceptives and abortion, that the spread of that will create a large population depression wherever it is enacted. And we have known that for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, the policy itself was meant to create that in, yes. in many cases and, and have a... a population that they would hoped i think would be more stable but it hasn't been um all of this meddling i think has gone awry but this is from the guardian like i said this year uh, study commissioned by the club of rome <laughs> yeah. mm. projects that on the current trends the world population will reach a high of about 8.3 billion a lot of people think that's far too optimistic um there's a large amount of projections that says that the world population's probably already peaked when you take into account China and that the decline outside of the West will be quite great and the decline in the West will be very, very great. 
<laughs> I, I, I'm not so sure. I think, to be honest, the collapse in second and third world countries will be more drastic because it will be more rapid and more damaging as it goes through. And previous studies have painted a grimmer picture. Last year, the UN estimated the world population would hit 9.7 billion by the middle of the century and continue to rise for several decades afterwards. I mean, I find that strange. Yeah. This is... The sort of writer you would expect. To... I believe this one's. I, I, I believe they've got a. Ver- that's a. They've got the wrong link. We have the right link later on. <laughs> but you would expect them to say that because there's less people, that that's grim. But no, because the environment here is the sort of ultimate prevailing factor, it becomes grim that there's going to be more people. I, I find that you know it's a very anti-progressive sort of thing to just unveil. You will notice that in both uh, sets of opinions here, that there's there's population is going down, that's bad. Population going down, that's good. Population going up, that's bad. Population going up, that's good. There is the full range of opinions That's what I was saying earlier on. There's like four sort of different possible options and every single one of them gets argued. What I find interesting as well, though, they say the report is based on a new methodology which incorporates social and economic factors that have a proven impact on birth rate, such as raising education levels, particularly for women, and improving income. Now, for 40, maybe 50 years, progressive educators have been standing up saying, you know, we can have the family and we can have women being educated too. And the UN and all these scientists turn around and say, actually, you can't, and that's a good thing. Despite the fact if you'd have said that 15, 20 years ago, well, what do you think women are... Women are useless because they can't be educated and also have children. <laughs> well, also for many years, we were educated not only that there was this population crisis. I'm sure it happened to you as well if you are basically between the age of about 50 and about 20. You'll remember it. Um, I don't know how teaching was before that point, but I have a, very, a pretty good handle on how teaching has been over the last 30 years. And this has been a a common factor that you will be taught, it will be drilled into you that there is a world population crisis. The world population is not going to drop. It's only going to get bigger. There's going to be some sort of Malthusian uh, environment that only technology and and liberalism can solve. Mm. And that was a lie. It was a lie really on the scale of climate change will end up being a lie. In 30, 40 years, the noises coming out of governments will be very different than they were during this time period. It's interesting to me that nobody's really going to hang on, you people lied to us. Because, mm. oh, well, the science has changed. But looking through all of this, and as we'll get to some of the metrics later on, it's been very obvious for a very long time that this is what was going to happen. Again, eugenics is trending. That's a problem. This is from is it? Washington, Washington Post. Post. I had to disable a whole bunch of stuff in here because I'm using the Wayback Machine, which sucks. Um, I did find and, archive.is was working later on today, so I don't know if that's... No, it's just giving me blank it. pages, I'm afraid. Oh, no. Richard Dawkins sparked controversy. Mm. <sighs> well, it's just saying any effort to slow population growth must center on reproductive justice. And there's a big push throughout of this where a lot of people said, well, if there's going to be too many people, if we need some form of population control... Why don't we just do population control? Why aren't we looking at who is breeding? Well, this is more <laughs> a suggestion that, you know, uh, if we've got immigration, we've got to make sure the immigrants are put about equitably. If we have climate change, we have to make sure the mitigation is handled equitably. If we have a population crisis and therefore have to engage in a eugenics program, then it must also be done equitably. Well, all of, most of this is just waffle about, oh, you can't... What's, the, talk. what's like the conclusion here? Although really... the United States, is, they, they talk about all oh, the dark clowns and people who want to control populations are evil. Uh, the conclusions here are... Unfortunately, while these efforts help advance the cause of women's rights, they also distract from the large drivers of climate change, such as high fossil fuel consumption. In fact, much of the support for the population movement, including its racist, anti-immigrant leanings, has been funded by f- powerful and wealthy people and corporations profiting off the consumption of fossil fuel energy. So today, people who have the lights on. <laughs> yeah, today we are seeing a resurgence of individual efforts to address environmental problems. We should praise those who seek to tackle climate change by choosing to have fewer children, which is the byline we've known for ages. Now. Yes. 
but we should also be careful not to reignite the darker forces behind population control or lose sight of the most harmful sources of environmental degradation. And, as history demonstrates, any effort to curb the population must be voluntary. Yeah. Rather than focus on controlling global fertility rates, we need to support and protect policies, ideas, and activism that foster greater reproductive choice, resources, and education for everyone. This is them kind of talking out of both sides of their mouths. Well, we need to do eugenics, but it can't look like eugenics. Yes. So instead, what it has to look like is giving phones to women in third world countries because we know when they have smartphones, they don't have children. It's, it's simple methods like that that supposedly give them more choice. Yes. But throughout the 1970s and 80s, the headline news was that populations were exploding, and that we needed to provide infinite food for countries with no resources, where people were having 17 children. And this was still the focus into the 2010s. Here's an article from the IMF. And it says, helping feed the world's fast-growing population for 2017. By Rabbi Arazeki. Um, one third of global food production goes to waste. That's most because of India. Um, <laughs> this, lock that up, by the way. That, that's true. Uh, India's supply lines are hilarious, and its population is incredibly precarious. Um, yeah, even with the explosion of our agricultural productivity since the middle of the 20th century, when certain people decided to reorientate the global world order so that to kill most of Europe, yeah. food security remains a challenge for much of the developing world. Food calorie production will have to expand by 70% by 2050 to keep up with a global population that's forecast to grow to 9.7 billion. Again, this is this is just a lie now, though. They are, through all the metrics that the globalists had themselves, this is just lying. Well, this is also six <laughs> years before theirs, but what what's happened in six years to make them go from projections of nearly 10 billion by the middle of the century to actually it might be less than it is now? Well, the issue is that it's become undeniable. Mm. A lot of people have started to look at it and go, look, where are these births going to come from? And they've kind of gone, because it, it, honestly, if you look at some of the literature, it's been that way since the 90s. There's a, there a few people who flagged this up, but it mm. hasn't really breached into the news cycle. And as we see here, anything really before about 2019 seems to try and stick with the old narrative, whereas, that there, are some, whereas there are some older articles as well that come out and, and bring forward an even more extreme version of the population reversion we may see. So, it's again, it's very clear that this has been known about for a very long time. It just hasn't has been deliberately kept out of the public um, discussion, out of the public discourse. In fact, the public discourse has been deliberately reversed as they try to incentivize people to keep going in the way that they need for, the, for their projects. Um, it's, it's just manipulation of public opinion through direct lies. It's the only way it could be. Again, here's another one. Will there be? Uh, will we find enough food for the nine billion? I believe this is like a horrible web. By twenty fifty, there were nine billion people. This is a horrible web three looking thing. So we can tell it's from. I believe this is from twenty twenty two. Although I can't seem to find a date on it right now. Um, I believe this is from twenty twenty two. Though, <laughs> again, we have this nine billion lie repeated again. Uh, it's it's simply not true. There's not going to be ten billion people in the world. Um, but the narrative persists in many places, and you've got these weird dueling narratives where a large amount of people are pretending that we've always known that this is going to happen, and a large amount of people are pretending that we don't know that this is going to happen, and that we do know there's going to be a, the population bomb, in quotes. Um, it, it's difficult because the narrative has also just begun to break down. As, as we talked about, I know you went to mention the whole degrowth stuff at some point. This might be a good opportunity to. The degrowth stuff, I think, is a way of somewhat rationalizing well you know let's say this specific line here is true yeah there's going to be 10 billion people we can't grow enough food to feed all those people without damage of the environment what what's the solution either a couple billion people die or you totally reinvent the structures of food to you know provide you know, say, for example, all the people in India and China with foods grown exclusively in India and China, which we know is never going to happen. for Technological reasons, for reasons related to the weather and geography, and also just the scale. It's just not going to happen. So the other option is, of course, just starve people to death. I mean, there has got to be some element here that must be reduced to solve this problem. 
Well, it's the whole discussion of why do we support populations that have overextended beyond their food supply to, an, to a comical degree. Yeah, and, well, I think the word unsustainable might be actually <laughs> quite appropriate in situations where you're talking about somewhere like India or China or even you know the more fledgling nations like Bangladesh, which are actually worse off on a certain sort of scale. Well, here's really the situation as it is right now. This, this is kind of the starting point of where you can de... If you were somebody who was coming at it from the outside, you start to notice some of these things in the news cycle. We went over this article in, in quite a lot of detail the other week, but the the age of migration and the, the explosion of population in the global south is part, i.e. sub-Saharan Africa, yes. as we'll get to in the maps. It's just sub-Saharan Africa because it's not happening in New Zealand and it sure as shit isn't happening in lots of South America. No. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this is only the start of the age of migration stuff. Again, this is William Haig, now best friends with Tony Blair. Um, but what he's talking about here is the narrative of this little window that they've got. The A side point of this really is the fact that the people in charge right now have quite a narrow window to do what they're hoping to do, yes. which is to leverage large excess populations in sub-Saharan Africa to make uh, Western nations not have clear demographic majorities in any sense, which makes the populations much easier to well, control. At, and the, at that, the same time as well, it's an attempt to stop any form of deflationary pressure Yes, or inversely, the inflationary pressures that they are putting upon the economy running completely out of line. Well, it, the uh, the th running theme here will be that the managerialism stuff does not make sense if a population is falling. It doesn't even if, work. Even if it's stable. Yeah, even if a population is stable, uh, modern managerialist theory doesn't work. Um, it was cooked up in the, the baby boom era um, in terms of kind of post-war policy stuff. But even the even the economics of Keynes and stuff that came in during you know post World War One, I, I think there was some sort of recognition that they must have come to that was well, if we are to keep, you know, engaging in debt based financing as we are, we will always need at least the the anticipation that in ten years time there will be a bigger population which can more easily soak up the debt that we are creating now. And that just carries on forever and ever and ever, really. Well, underpinning a lot of this is the uh, implicit assumption that Britain just needs to onboard as many warm bodies as possible. You can see in William Hague's article some of the population panic that is overcoming many of the managerial class. As This is what the 1.4 million people are about. See, look at that graph there yeah. you've got. Yeah. Increasing population of other ethnicities 2001 to 2020. This is Migration Watch. Again, we, we went through this during our uh, what becomes the Zuma stream, Again, I believe. This is missing, you know, the other three to four million that have come in since 2020 yeah. as well, which would then skew this even further towards the sort of foreign born well, side. Look at this. This is a bad situation. Uh, we've been over it before, but we are still, even with this demographic shift, even with the increased birth rates from recent immigrants. They are still not above like replacement level birth rates in Britain. Yes, um, that's why they have to keep bringing ever more. In fact, this is a losing battle. What happens is these people get siphoned into Britain, and then something about the Western world makes people both unwilling to have children and infertile, as we'll get to. Well, yeah, the, <laughs> by the time that this is the sort of one of the other unspoken elements is other than you know very very specific sects and castes of people. The vast majority of people who are foreign-born origin that come over to Britain don't really go on to have more than really two generations of kids after that. Yes. You know, and if they do, it tends to be, you know, stereotypical Western households of one or maybe two children at most. Well, what's interesting is that the, the discussion around population has gone almost overnight from runaway population boom a runaway population collapse. Yes. Um, with nothing in between. <laughs> but, but notice how both of those work for immigration. Yes. Too many people in third world countries, they have to come here. Yeah. Not enough people in our country, they have to come here. So it, no matter what way you argue it, there's always an excuse to move brown people to white countries. Yes, the, the excuse is always more brown. But 
I want to bring this up because as we look through the raw data on birth rates, um, do remember that a large part of the, the even the low birth rates in the West uh, is contributed to by immigrants. And without the immigration that we've seen, these numbers will be a lot lower. That's why the managerial class did it. That's their excuse, really, is the fact that our populations on their own are collapsing. Rather than trying to address why Western populations are collapsing, they just keep trying to funnel people into Western countries, who then, within a generation, are already failing to have children. They have not reckoned with the fact that modernity makes people not want to reproduce uh, and be not able to reproduce. But, well, what is what is the contemporary narrative about this? Because a lot of it is from this year. I've been trying to look for as old a stuff as possible in terms of, like, the narrative. I, because the narrative around the population collapse, because it is happening. We'll show you all the way it's happening. But the narrative around it is important because I think it shows that there isn't, there isn't a joint approach about what to say about it. No. There isn't a joint approach whether to say it's happening or not at all. And there really is a sense of confusion when it comes to how it interacts with other parts of the narrative. This what, I was, I'm almost certain we were talking about some of this stuff when we were kicking up the notes earlier on today. Yeah, that it was either it might have been David Cameron at some point before the run up to the 2010 election. Essentially said that it may become essentially a conservative party policy to make sure that the population of Britain does not go above 60 million. Yeah. And then here we are, 10 years later, 15 years later, oh, population decline is actually true, not growth. Ergo, this is also good. Yes. Um, a lot of the politicians will basically come out and try to say that they, they'd known this all along, which they have. But the solution isn't simply the onboarding of more interchangeable warm bodies. I've got some more long-form stuff on that later. But the Scientific American seems to take the it's happening and it's good approach yes. to it. <laughs> so this is the it's happening, it's good. A future with fewer people offers increased opportunities and a healthy environment. Um, this is the only one about population decline in the abstract I could find. A lot of them talk about birth rates. Mm. Um, Whereas the discussion of kind of population size in the abstract is weirdly divorced from that. It seems that the two things are not discussed at the same time. No. Like, the t like, there has almost been a delinking of the two in terms of the Western narrative because population numbers are no longer seen as a function of birth rate. They're seen as a function of immigration. Yes. And that's been the case really since the 1970s, which is... Uh, it's an interesting twist to this, but keep that little little nugget in mind because some of the stuff becomes a bit weird well, unless what you I, uh, what detect What I find that. strange as well is to scroll down yeah. that second paragraph there. Yeah. Declining populations will ease the pressure people put in the environment, blah, blah, blah. As the population and sustainability directed at the Centre for Biological Diversity. I've seen the devastating effects of our ever-expanding footprint of global ecosystems, blah, blah. But if you listen to economists and Elon Musk, you might believe falling birth rates mean the sky is falling as fewer babies means fewer workers and consumers driving economic growth. What again, what I find interesting here is that the right wing response yeah. to this is no, our Keynesian system of neoliberalism is going to collapse because they're not going to be an infinite number of people to bring into the country. There's a breakdown here of the narratives because this is almost like an anti-capitalist. This is a, almost like a, de as you mentioned, a degrowth argument. Yes. This is a line can no longer go up. Depopulation is a good thing, but it also doesn't factor in the fact that all of our systems in the West are geared towards incentivizing people with retirement and having people under retirement age work to make the retirement of those people viable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, let me go down to the conclusions here because there's not really, there's not, a few, it talks about China a bit. It basically just talks about yeah. some things we've uh, scroll up. To Finally, yeah. we need what the United Nations uh, most recent climate and biodiversity reports drive home and conservationist climate science and policymakers have demanded for decades a rapid, just transition, transition the to renewable there. energy and sustainable food systems and a global commitment to halting human-caused extinctions now. What does this have to do with population decline? Yeah, population stabilisation and decline will inevitably be achieved by centering human rights. Oh. Policymakers must guarantee bodily autonomy and access to reproductive health care, gender equity, and women and girls' education. 
we need to have factories that make women kill their own babies for the sake of the environment. It's the yes. only way forward. By addressing the crisis in front of us, empowering everyone to decide if they want to have children, which is a, a you'll see that everywhere. Empowering everyone to decide if they want to have children. And but, planning for population what, decline. We can choose a future of sustainable answer, abundance. What makes this even so <laughs> even more so frustrating is as you've sort of said, inversely, the answer is already there. We've educated native white women to not have children. This will cause the population to collapse, and that will solve the environmental problem. But this is so. Why do we need the immigrants? Yes, <laughs> it's self-defeating. As I said, the narrative is at odds with itself because this very obviously is, by extension, an anti-immigration argument. Yes, but it's not because the person who makes this argument would not make an, an anti-immigration argument. But it's very clear. Well, so it's that, got to be a just transition. Well, it's very clear <laughs> that what they're saying doesn't make sense because it's out-group rhetoric. Yes. The in-group rhetoric really is is what we've seen in becoming a minority. It's we are going to leverage these global catastrophes to to somehow make sure that we're still on top. Yep. And that's what we see everywhere. This internally. <laughs> yeah. Why would Stephanie filed Steam write this? <laughs> As I think at this moment. I will make the important reminder that on the Scrump Monkey channel, we have an undying love for the nation of Israel, we do, yes. which we believe to be the most legitimate democracy on this planet. But anyway, that's enough words from our sponsors. Well, The Economist seems to think that this is a disaster. Uh, their, their headline, their take on this, uh, again, from, I believe, 2023. Says, uh, yeah, it says June, first June when it was first put up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of June it was first put up, but... Um, global fertility has collapsed with profound consequences. Ooh. What might change the world's dire demographic trajectory? Very different tone. <laughs> John Gordon, I love Israel more than anyone in this chat. <laughs> so um, National Geographic has gone for it's not happening and that's a bad thing. Uh, the Scientific American has gone for it's happening and that's a good thing. And The Economist has gone for it's yeah. happening and that's a bad thing. So we've got all four. We've got like the checkerboard graph. If you draw them <laughs> up, all the possible permutations. We've got them all. Um, so they talk about 250 years, blah, blah. Oh, this is not one that's loaded correctly. Um, in 2000, the fertility rate was 2.7 births per woman comfortably. Today, it's 2.3. There's not really a lot in here um, that is unique to this article. But we know, we know what the arguments are going to be. It's going to be that uh, national debt and national insurance... Uh, Liabilities can't be met. Uh, we we can't sustain social other social security systems like benefits. Or is it decided it's working now? Yeah, it's decided. Oh, oh, it's decided the paywall is loaded now. <laughs> uh, you know we can't have a constantly growing economy that's free market with this happening. We can't keep all these other services functioning. We can't keep our education working. Uh, our people will get too old. It's all the same nonsense yeah. it's always been. Eventually, therefore, the world will have to make do with fewer youngsters, perhaps with a shrinking population. With that in mind, recent advances in AI, AI. could not have come at a better time. An uber-productive AI-infused economy might find it easy to support a greater number of retired people. <laughs> mm. Well, this is, again, this is the future tech inherent in all managerial okay. discussions about you the future. You think this is bad? Read yeah. the next slide. Yeah. Eventually, AI may be able to generate ideas by itself. No Satanist, take your demons elsewhere. Reducing the need for human intelligence combined with robotics, AI may also make caring for the elderly less labor intensive. Such innovations will certainly be in high demand. Actually, like full on gay luxury space communism. If technology does allow humanity to overcome the baby bust, it will fit the historical pattern. Unexpected predict productivity advances meant that demographic time bombs, such as the mass starvation predicted by Thomas Malthus in the 18th century, failed to detonate, uh, except from when they repealed the corn laws in the UK and people nearly kind of starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> Fewer babies means less human genius. Not true. But that might be a problem, a, a problem human genius can fix. I mean, there's just so much waffle in there. There's the complete total rejection of any idea that some certain humans are maybe more useful than others well that's a, a common thing throughout all of this is the belief in population yes the belief in raw numbers of people um here's kind of the meat of it this is possibly the best one here uh by the visual capitalist Ooh. 
Mm-hmm. It's not got a lot of good analysis, but it does have this graphic, which basically is the graphic we'll be nicking here. Um, cause this, this gives us everything we need. Uh, thank you. Weird, uh, visual capitalist side. It talks about the fact that in 1970, global birth rates were at nearly five. That actually sounds too high to me, to be honest. I believe that is probably an overestimate. Um, but now global birth rates are down near 2.3. Still optimistic. Still optimistic. <laughs> but here's, here's the kicker. Here's the real picture. Because hopefully you'll be able to see this on screen. Um, the lowest 10 are South Korea, Hong Kong, Puerto Rico, Macau, Singapore, Malta, Ukraine, possibly for obvious reasons, Spain, Italy, and China. So you have Asia, Europe, and smaller countries um, rep- kind of represented there. That seems to be the trend of low, lowest population kind of birth rate is the fact that is Asia, Southern Europe, and small countries, Singapore, Malta, Places like that, yeah, smaller highest, nations. Highest 10, Niger. Oh, they've been in the news recently. Somalia, Chad. Chad. They've been in the news recently. Democratic Republic of Congo, Mali. Mali. Central, they've been in the news recently. Central African Republic, Angola, Nigeria, Burundi, and Benin. Well, Benin. If, it's, Benin. A, it's a strange quirk that three of the highest birth rate countries... They're all neighbours. They're all neighbours. They're all in a row, and they're all about to possibly be invaded by uh, like the UN. Um, which would a uh, the reason why a war in Chad, Niger, and I think it's the other one's Mali, isn't it? Mali um, would be so disastrous is because that they are these giant population explosion places with massive young populations, and if you have food insecurity due to war in them, then you could very very quickly see this. Even this side of the population engine destroy itself. But this is also the consequence of... Yeah, the African continent is home to, th- to the top 15 highest fertility rates in the world. This is but, a direct yeah. consequence of heavily technologically engaged populations in the developing world, or developed world, handing down amounts of food that don't even really... that can't even really be consumed. Yes. I mean, this is the thing I've always considered when they do the food aid stuff, is how much of that can actually be allocated and used in any sort of way that's useful. It doesn't just lead to, you know, the five or six largest cities in Niger or Somalia doubling in population every 10 years well, to that's, the site of, like, just horrendous treatment. This is what this represents, that we have had population explosions in Saharan and Sub-Saharan Africa generated by unlimited food aid from the Western world. That has been the driving force through most of this population explosion. It's happened in some other places too, but mostly in Africa. As we see here, the birth rate in India is actually relatively low now. Um, A lot of the population appeared during that 1970s period. Yes. They will have at some point the largest population in the world, but mostly because they are declining slightly slower than China is, as we'll get to. But this graph... Yeah. Question, why didn't African countries have such high birth rates 100 years ago, Western medicine, or do we just not have the data from back then? Uh, they lived in the third... They lived in deserts like they were cavemen. They, they were <laughs> limited by their environment. Yeah. 100 years ago, you didn't have the... You didn't have live aid. You didn't have the UN. You didn't have also large didn't, NGOs. You also didn't have Western agricultural... You, or you, the ability to import millions of tons of food every week on tanker ships. You did, but the West was doing that, and that was cutting edge at the point at the time. Compared to the scale that it's done today, though, especially yes. since the sixties and seventies, to go all the way back to sort of nineteen twenty, is it's a completely different kettle of fish, really. Well, it's it's what you get when you you know what do you get when you feed five million Africans, ten million Africans? Yeah. <laughs> it's just, <sighs> <laughs> Uh, well, sorry, it's what do you get when you feed 5 million starving Africans, 10 million starving Africans. Yes, that's the one. Um, and as we'll get to later, this has very large implications because everyone's talking about the West. But the numbers are relatively consistent. They're just about above water in kind of South Asia and the Middle East, but they're close. I believe the number they talk about is 
mm. generally yeah, because of de- because well. of other deaths as well, generally being considered as maintenance level. There are <clears throat> many, many countries that are below that, and there are a lot of countries that are hovering around that. And the trend is downwards. The trend is ever downwards um, at the moment, as we'll see. But that this is the current state, and people saying this is a Western problem are wrong. It is furthest along in the West, but this is a global problem. And it's a problem, as we see through through the chronology of it, this is the problem of like a managerial society. Yes. Non-traditional societies cannot create children. It is alarming how bad they are at creating human beings. But anyway. It's almost like it's not a natural environment for us to live in when there's this much technology around. No. Um, this is from ARP.org. Uh, I, I can't remember. I think it's one of the little... Uh, um, it's just that, like a, it's like a pew. Is that like tarp? <laughs> no, it's like a pew census data. Uh, okay, data I, kind of I was getting thing. myself mixed up there. But this is talking about the United States being an aging nation. It has a few kind of graphs here about the. But this is the one I want to focus on here. Older adults will soon outnumber children. This again is the scare graphic used to promote immigration to Americans in many places. I bet that in, you know, this is probably, you know, averaged out across all ethnicities, that on a long enough timeline, this problem becomes more drastic amongst foreign populations and Western nations than it does amongst Western populations and Western nations. Think about... The precipitous drop is higher. Well, so to think about, say, for example, your... Afro Caribbeans that came over here as with Windrush. There wasn't loads and loads of them, but there's definitely still the old ones around. The vast majority of them did not have kids or grandkids. Or their children didn't have children. Mm. Um, it's a wide issue with the American population because, as we've seen, it's no longer. It used to be 14%, it's now 13%. Part of that is due to Hispanic birth rates and greater immigration from other sources, but it's also just the fact that. American uh, blacks have the lowest birth rate in America. Well, so, I mean, the, the, the <laughs> African-American stock that has been there for, say, 100, 150 years at least is actually a, a stock that is declining faster than the native population itself. Well, the narrative in the scientific American is, is at odds with American policy, mm-hmm. which is line go up, line support retirement. When you have, as the cliff gets ever bigger... And I believe the baby boomers may be one of the extreme ends of this. But if, if we see a continuous situation where the over 65 population is larger than the, you know, the children under 18 and then the working age, you know, large parts of the working age population uh, becomes proportionally smaller compared to it, you will see all of these systems break down. Mm. It, it is not, as, as I'll get to later, it is not sustainable to maintain kind of the 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 day the adult daycare state well, that see, is uh, this retirement. Is, this is why the sort of people that go out there and portray themselves as as right of centre or right wing, and then you know put out all these cases about you know oh, we are the anti luddites. We believe in futurism and technology. Yeah, and they argue that you know technology exists to propagate culture. Technology in Western nations actually ends up in the mitigation of not just culture but the people that would produce and carry on that culture you know it's not just that these things are are bad in a sort of abstract sense where all oh, some of the some of the bits of our value and meaning is diluted you know as a collective being the british people the biggest threat to them as far as i'm concerned from all this stuff and as we'll continue to go on it's not immigrants it's technology yes um and it's something that they can't really explain via choice. No. Because the reasons for this have nothing to do with people's personal choices. No. Or at least they have very little to do with people's personal choices. I mean, there's... The direct answer is that sperm counts have just dropped. Modernity does not promote the proliferation of humans as we know them. The modern world is also quite literally emasculating men. Well, no. (laughs) I mean, people can go back and watch the stream we did with uh, philosopher cat on Evola's book uh, Eros and the Mysteries of Love uh, something something this is something sex. that was flagged up by what was derogatively referred to as all part of the manosphere in about 2015 yeah. in fact the the testosterone level and related sperm count drop has been kind of a narrative since the late 90s in like male health culture 
It is it is one of the few things that uh, has emerged out of the kind of pickup artist MRE suit that is has frankly outflanked the scientific community, at least in a visible sense. I don't remember this being talked about in mainstream circles, but I remember this being talked about in alternative circles quite heavily. Yes. And it has been borne out. It is true. Uh, in fact, the, the numbers are alarming. Um, the average sperm concentration far from estimated, 101.2... Uh, it's basically half. ...million per meter to 49.0. It, is, it has gone down by 51.6%, more than half. Total sperm counts fell by 62.3% during the same period. Um... <laughs> But we can we can see this beyond sperm counts. Man are, are men are not the men they were a hundred years ago. Women are not the women they were a hundred years ago. This is once again putting my vert freaked value free hat on for a minute. Modernity, the conditions of democracy, living living with extended food chains that basically rid us of any want to procreate because in some sort of sense we do feel that we owe our own lives and we will live forever. There is no impetus to reproduce. No. Um, John Morton mentions very much the correct thing in that a lot of that is down to obesity, but also a lot of kind of problems with Western nations in general is down to obesity. It's yeah. one of the quite... We'll probably talk... We'll probably just do a stream about it at some point because we're going to have... The to. infinite fat camp. Yeah, the infinite fat camp, uh, the infinite Mars bar. Um, but uh, no, the the BBC blames all this on pollution. There's not enough evidence to blame this on solely pollution. They try to turn this into a green problem. Um, but you the, see, uh, there's there's people in the chat there. Women are encouraged into men's roles, and we wonder why so many are depressed. Yes, but what you're seeing there is not problem what you're seeing is a symptom of all the same problems yes it all goes back to the fact that in these conditions within modernity technology as it is men and women are not what they were before and are not capable of reproducing well i'd, I'd like to go into my quick spiel here which is the fact that all of these population booms were engineered yes uh the population boom post-war was very very clearly engineered and the population boom in the quote-unquote global south has been engineered very carefully by large NGOs and governments. They knew this would happen. It is mm. incredulous to think that they did not know this would happen. And so we can also see that, we can see this really as almost like a self-regulating system in that they have gone in, they have meddled, they have created these artificial population booms. Mm. And really, nature has responded by saying no more people. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, they've enforced it on their own people they've tried to make birth rates drop in the west um, as a way to create a situation where they do have to import people or can justify importing people but I believe they have lost control of this process and a lot of their rhetoric about it seems to be that they are not or trying not to think about it basically well I think I think a large part of it fully steps outside of the modern liberal and progressive views. Yes. Because what they understand is, okay, they can put all these cultural things out there about how educating women uh, reduces fertility. It does, but it's, it's getting them into the workplace, it's masculinizing them, it's giving them technical priorities over organic priorities. It's all these elements that go sort of almost beyond culture to an extent. They are just like the material conditions that man lives in. These are the things that are determining his ability to procreate or not. And for some of the people who I think study a lot of this stuff, even though they, they think of themselves as cold, hard, analytical scientists, to suggest that this is something you can't change without drastically changing all material conditions underneath is too much for them. So they don't even address it. Well, what's mentioned here is IVF, which mm. is what people are increasingly turning to. And IVF is a, another example of, of the sticking plaster that's put over the middle class fertility rate in Western nations. We have a massive industry of getting people pregnant who naturally can't get pregnant, no. um, which also in turn creates lower fertility populations via genetics. Uh, there is a, almost like a eugenics engine in the West of creating discogenic low birth rate children uh, that is not being talked about or thought about and will not be in the scope of this. Well, this is, you know, <laughs> not only are people, are people aging, but the age at which people have children is also increasing rapidly. 
Well, there's two. That is one of the aspects of this, but there's also the issue that C sections and multi generational C sections mean that certain classes of women, especially non white women, birth canals just seize up. Yes, they, they <laughs> do not awful. have a wide enough birth canal to naturally birth a child. Yes. And um, this, again, is not sustainable in a situation where there isn't, say, mass access to Western medicine. You can't do a C section in an ad hoc environment. It is an exceptionally major surgery. And the fact that women are starting to lose the ability to give birth naturally should be alarming. Well, but a large part of it as well is the fact that you're very literally your passage through the birth canal makes you interact with all sorts of bizarre antibodies and bacteria and this, that, and the next thing that you're supposed to pick up as you essentially enter the world. By not going through the natural sort of passage, as it were, yes. you miss out on a lot of these things that become quite vital. And what you might find is all this nonsense about having these things like super MRSA, super gonorrhea, are maybe just a consequence of the fact that people are being more frequently born by C-section and not getting certain benefits that they would otherwise get out of it. Well, uh, we, we brought up that Economist article earlier, which talks about the economic line-go-up implications of falling populations, where they try and hand wave it away with AI, mm. which is very funny. Um, I'd read that part, but I just, it's so stupid. Mm. It's honestly insulting. But they also have, I'm not going to play much of it because we'll probably get copyright struck, but they have a whole thing of, is it worth it? Is it worth having kids? And that's the, that is the, when childbirth is talked about, is talked about as not a natural part of most people's lives, but as something, it's like an alien made this. Yes. Normal people who have the drive to procreate. Do not think in this way. Well, I, I think of this more the fact if you were to try and explain this to someone 250 years ago, yeah, you know, if you said to them the, the simple sentence that having children is a life or death issue, they go, well, of course it is. Because if you don't have four children and then you know three of your children don't go on to have two or three children as well, by the time you're 60, there will be no one there to support you. Yes. But nowadays it's life or death because men and women aren't capable of actually doing it. And then when they do actually do it, the conditions around it and the culture is so pervasively against having children that it becomes life or death in a totally different context. <laughs> well, I just want to highlight the fact that the way that mainstream journalists talk about children is like an alien word. Yes. And we move on from the physiological oh, stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Sian Kane, with your, <laughs> your fucking well, multiple earrings and your bald head. Well, we just get into the fact that liberalism and its resultant leftism has a virulent hatred of both children and the family. Yes. It is something that, even though I think they realise that they shouldn't be expressing it in these, it's almost like these people cannot help themselves. No. Um, there is a... An anti-child, anti-family, and anti-human line to most of modern liberalism and modern leftism. It is dripping in it, and it is found in its founding documents. At some point, we'll go over Wilhelm Reich and people like that, Theodor Adorno, and all of the Western cultural Marxists who wanted to detonate the family. Um, the resultant drop in birth rates has been precipitous, mm -hmm. um, but... Here we go. Why a generation is choosing to be child-free. It's the more of the waffle about reproductive rights. It really isn't worth reading this. Anything in the conclusion at all? Uh, you can read the conclusion paragraph. Uh, go it's, ta it's, it's talking climate about... Climate crisis has presented an opportunity to rebrand being child-free once the greatest taboo into the ultimate altruistic... Again, this notion that however, being child-free was a cultural taboo. No. It was beyond just simple culture, beyond simple virtue. You had children because you had to. <laughs> Into the ultimate altruistic act. At the same time, parenthood is framed as the ultimate investment in a better future. But choosing to have children is neither inherently good nor selfish. And the same goes for being child-free. Hmm... We must challenge the orthodoxy that says choosing to live one way is a criticism of another. Ah, no, it's neutrality. Neutrality rears its head again. 
Just this week comes a new novel by Emma Gannon, all of which centres on a woman in her 30s who has chosen to be... Yeah, yeah, it, uh, uh, mostly articles like this. Oh. But really, this is just a giant cope for child-free women in their child-free women in their thirties. We, we need more of a supportive culture for horrendous child. But the spinsters. narrative of being child-free for the planet yeah. is something that has been a through line in the last twenty years, especially. There's one here that's even more explicit about it from 2018. Would you give up having children to save the planet? Meet the couples you have with the terrible flat people are. Well, it's it's an alternative to offer to middle class, politically engaged women that don't want to be active lesbians. <laughs> is that instead they can be celibates or asexual for the climate. There's an even more bizarre one. I'm kind of thundering through these. These has the same conclusion to it, yes, basically. This is essentially the same article in a slightly different format. There's one here from the Atlantic simply called a World Without Children by Emma Green, a generation facing an intractable, uh, in, facing intractable problems, debates whether to bring a new generation into the world. God, I think I can remember this one when it actually came out. There was a lot of people talking about that back then. There was, yes, but I'd I say that Miley uh, Cyrus vowed to not have a baby on this piece of shit planet. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mused in an Instagram video about whether it's still okay to have children. Polls suggest that a third or more of, of Americans in the 45 either don't have children or expect to have fewer than they might otherwise because they are worried about climate change. But I, I don't want to engage too much with this. One, because the paywall is really suddenly ahead. Two, quite frankly, I actually don't want to treat the argument that people aren't having kids because of climate change that seriously. It is a. It I is... think that's an excuse for people who are actually immature and again actually otherwise incapable of bringing healthy children to adulthood we've talked about the biological facts of this this is mostly cope as i've written in my uh, in my notes here uh, we stand uh, at, sorry as we stated in the what becomes of the zuma stream there is not a choice environment but the outgrowth of economic reality um Young people mostly live in bed sits. They live in rented rooms or, or one bedroom flats if they're lucky and will never be able to afford a family home under current circumstances. The multi generational household is gone. Even when they do have kids, it creates dysgenics through, uh, and they have to do it through IVF and C sections. Yes. Um, but no, I just I, I want to make the point clear. And I think this is something that we actually have to. We have to go out and test this somehow. Because I think if you knew people personally who would otherwise tell you they won't have children because of climate change, that the real issues why they won't have children are much more deeper and systemic than just the news told me the environment's bad, so I don't want to have kids. This is a... What we see is, one, an outward hatred of the family, but two, is an excuse because these people cannot have children. That is the outgrowth yes. of that. It's not, it's not that... They are choosing to have children for different reasons. They They're aren't not, choosing. There's, there's no choice. And there the is no choice. These people do not feel they can have children or physically cannot have children. That is the answer. Yes. It is not a democratic, democrat, democratic choice <laughs> of a market environment in which women have been liberated. It is quite simply the outgrowth of reality. Um, again, Scientific American study confirms link between older maternal age and autism. It's also a risk factor in basically everything. It turns out that you have the healthiest kids when you are healthiest having children, which is in oh, your... You, you can't see that. If you're trying to suggest that women should have children before they're age 25, you're a paedophile. I was say, it, it, you should have a child between the age of 21 and 25. You should, in fact, you should have multiple children between the ages of 21 and 25. And then you shouldn't have children again. Um, and that has been the way it's worked for hundreds of years in many places. A lot of them had well, them earlier, a lot even of them had them later. But yeah. I mean, this is the thing as well. Once again, I'm going to put my value-free hat on. Yeah. There is a reason why men, despite all the things that have been done to their brains in the modern world, are generally attracted to women aged between 18 and 21. Because this is quite literally when they are in their biological prime. Firstly, there's the reason why women are attracted to men roughly between sort of 24 and 28. Because this is those men when they are in their prime. 
well, and there's also a trend of something of of women I've kind of labeled the anti mother. Yes, who are people who are the opposite of nurturing and kind, which is all of the now actually slightly outdated looking shout your abortion stuff. Um, of of, of course we had the right here. That's Chinese popular. We'll, we'll come to that in a sec. We have the whole salute to abortion thing. I've got it here as well. It was on Netflix with Michelle Wolf that was very badly received. You have the shout your abortion people. Uh, it's just the imagery, really. That all of this stuff is hateful. Hmm. It is anti-human and creates these female figures who are the anti-mothers. Yep. These are the birthers of death. <laughs> <laughs> the Leliths, you might say. Yes. <laughs> uh, people are dotting. Yeah, just, yeah, go around calling yourself Lilith. is like calling yourself Lucifer. Just don't do it. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's genuinely disturbing. And I, I do not, I think people who are abortionists in a, in a later age, in the age of population collapse, will be looked back on like, we now are taught to look back on eugenicists. Uh, I, I believe that there may at some point be mass disdain for these people. I'm, again, I'm not so sure because I think in a large sense these people will be looked at not as the symptom, but again, or no, sorry, not as the, the original problem, but symptom of some great, you know, if it's ever actually honestly delivered to us, the knowledge that's required to understand that, as we've repeated time and again in this stream, People in modernity do not procreate. No. And that just has to oh. be, you know, essentially explained, at least to all the people that will in some way understand it. I can't believe we've come all this way without doing a collapse watch. <laughs> I'm afraid we're just on permanent collapse watch because even the news acknowledges that the collapse is happening. Yes. It's... All, all those people who were like, oh, nothing's ever happening. It is happening. You've just got used too used to it all happening. Mm. It's When it's happening, they will not tell you it's happening. When it isn't happening, they'll tell you it's happening. But any, anyway. Uh, um, people are talking about uh, dunking them all in the water when the, in the cuck chair. <laughs> oh, dear. But yeah, there's, there's all of this anti-child stuff out here. Um, and it's very obvious that somebody knew this was coming. <laughs> um... Because to cap it off, kind of my my little bit here to cap off the Western section, because we'll quickly go through in the in the last half hour how. Well, because you see, we're we're in the last twenty minutes here. Yeah, I think how, <laughs> how things are in the developing world, because that's that's a very simple picture, mm. a very simple picture, a very old world picture, <laughs> and very much the kind of picture that I think we've been painting for years about China, and which is the fact that it's a paper tiger who can't manage itself. But oh, no. anyway. Uh, Britain's mysterious baby boom. Um, this is from June 2011. It's not mysterious. What happened is Tony Blair brought in a lot of immigrants from third world countries. And, and they had kids. And for a very brief period, they had third world birth rates. Um, but it was only for a very brief period. Here's what it is. Trend over time until the fertility rate England and Wales. Here we see it between 1960 and 1975, i.e. women's liberation, in quotes reducing from above replacement levels, not going to replacement levels, but crashing down beneath them and and, st and staying there forevermore. Mm. Um, in 2000, birth rates began to increase as the immigrant populations that Tony Blair brought in began to procreate. But as we'll see later, they then dropped back down again. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the graph tells the story of the high fertility rates of the, uh, of the 60s plummeted with the availability of contraceptive pill, and stuck well below the level required to replace the population for 25 years. It's weird that no one ever tried to do anything about that. Well, they, the British, however, have traditionally rejected the notion of politicians interfering in family life. Not true. <laughs> yeah, not true. As today's RAND report puts it, successive UK governments have pursued an essentially, an essentially neoliberal policy, leaving decisions about childbearing to families and maintaining a laissez-faire attitude towards the economy. Yes. Except from all those periods where they promoted contraception. Except for all the periods they, they promoted contraception and abortion. Yeah. And still do. And still, like, 
uh, exposing a country to effective abortion on demand yeah. is, is interfering Look, in family it's life. It's all a bit of a puzzle. The experts at RAND Europe looked at a range of explanations as to why British women had apparently changed their minds about having larger families. They did. It's the immigrants. <laughs> we know this now. Uh, oh. Even the BBC wouldn't pretend to be this ignorant at the time. Uh, trends over time and age-specific fertility rates. Um, it, uh, basically, they just talk about the fact that 30 to 34, 35 to 39 seems to be climbing because of the like the IVF factor. Um, but a lot of that again is due to immigrants in late, you know, coming over and using our facilities to have later life children. Um, it's just uh, yeah. all. As the researchers put it, in attempting to improve the quality of children's lives, the policies are likely to have the unintended effect of increasing the quantity of children born. As a reminder, perhaps of the law, unintended consequences work. Tony Blair's determination to help the young may have inadvertently helped with the challenge of the old. Nope. <laughs> Turns out, here's a Telegraph article from 2019. Blair's reckless population explosion sowed the seeds for Brexit, although few will now admit it. He talks about even, you know, the, the population hitting 70 million within a decade. And the population explosion is down purely to immigration. What does it say here? Uh, there, there were many causes of Brexit, but historians will surely look at the impact of population growth on public sentiment in England. Again, we went through the fertility rates of native Brits. This is all immigration driven. Uh, culpability must be with Tony Blair's government, even though they brought in less immigrants than the Conservatives now have. In, in the 20 years before Labour came to office in 1997, the population rose by 2 million, and the 20 years since has grown by 8 million. <laughs> what was done to prepare for this? The seeds of Brexit and today's political crisis were sown, but really what we can see is them attempting to onboard as many people as possible before the population craters once again. Um, Financial Times. Um, here we get on to some of the non-Western picture. Um, but I'll, before we do that, what I'm going to do is I've got a little, little, little bit of a spiel here, kind of capping off the situation in the West, which is as early as 1997, people like Blair knew that a massive decline in global population in developed countries was already ongoing, despite the prevailing narrative since the 1960s being that of global population control and record world populations. Underpinning all of this is the belief in humanity as an interchangeable economic unit that you can use managerialism and raw population numbers to cheat nature and create ever-expanding revolutions of mass and scale. The vision of the managerialist is that the biggest population wins, regardless of human experience within it. And you can see that notion peppered throughout everything we have yeah. just read. Well, now you've got a last bit here as well. The policies we see are a result of the fact that the line no longer goes up. And the line has not gone up in proportion to the global population enough to mitigate its collapse. Politicians will likely switch from ignoring per capita measures to relying on them only in certain areas. Yes. Um, I believe that it's already happening because as, as managerialism, as liberalism, as line go up goes into reverse, as line goes down, certain things will become better on a per capita basis. I believe in the coming decades we'll see a lot more use of per capita statistics. Um, but the, the picture outside the West, we have the Financial Times here complaining about population anxiety, fueling harmful fertility policies since the UN. Overlapping global crisis led to fears of both high and low birth rates. And it's mostly due to the birth rate imbalances. You have population explosion crises caused by Western NGOs in Sub-Saharan Africa, and you have population collapses caused by Western NGOs in other parts of the developing world. Yes. Um, and the two are in conflict with each other. But this is basically going to the fact that some countries now have population control measures and some have population encouragement measures. Yes. And the two are incompatible and create a large amount of confusion, which is true. I'll quickly just go down to the... There's a bit about fertility. There's not some... There's actually some not great graphs in here. They're all quite unclear. Uh, too high, too low, blah blah blah. So wait, France is too high, or is that a certain subset of no, France? No, no. Is too Societies high? across the world are concerned about overpopulation and their own country's fertility rates. Do you fertility rate and population size? France basically believes they're overcrowded because they've had immigrants fired into them. It's not, yeah, no, exactly. Um, this is very silly. Uh, too high, too low. So France is both too rate. high and too low, and also about right. Again, this article doesn't <laughs> make a lot of sense apart from highlighting the conflicting policies. True, but 
one of the areas where this has been allowed to surface, and I believe has led to a lot of this narrative, is people trying to say that Russia's about to collapse. Mm. Because the Russia's population nightmare they talk about here, and they've talked about in quite a few places, about, oh, don't worry about Russia, they're all going to collapse because the population's going to go down. It's also just a picture everywhere. Mm. They do have, yes, a relatively low fertility rate, but it's about on par with a lot of, of other countries' immigration taken out of it. And they don't have the same problems that, uh, even though Russia still technically is an empire, they don't have the same problem of wasting massive resources trying to integrate Somalians into their country. No. Um, this just talks, the war in Ukraine has aggravated a crisis that, has, that long predates the conflict. There was, of course, the slight boom in the 90s uh, and then some decline after. Actually, birth rates are lower post-Soviet, which a lot of people said shouldn't be possible because of the great availability of food. But anyway, um, a, a lot of the... It turns out the availability of food actually isn't that large a factor unless, of course, what you're doing is bringing food to a population that should be otherwise starving. Yes. <laughs> A lot of the old rhetoric about this, but basically they're talking about the fact that the projected, um, again, the deaths is ridiculous because they're factoring all the fake deaths from NATO. Oh, the, the million Russian soldiers that have died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or whatever oh, the, silly the number uh, The demographic Banan. doom loop has not diminished Mr. Putin's craving for conquest, but it is making Russia a smaller, worse educated and poorer country. Just like every other yeah. semi-developed nation is becoming. But they're, they're talking in isolation here about the Russian population collapse, which is true, but there's a global population collapse. Uh, the, the, the infographic we saw, I'm not going to get it back up, because it was on, on screen long enough. Um, the, the, the demographics change there. Oh, sorry, I realize I've been on that screen for a while. This is the FT article that was highlighting the population anxiety stuff. Uh, it really just kind of waffled, and some of its charts didn't make any sense. That's what you missed on screen there. Um, but yeah, the Russia's population nightmare here from The Economist, again, is just them describing the situation in most of the world. Mm. Um, there is a lot of indications as well that Russia um, is not the worst off no. <laughs> in this sense either, because the, um, the population decline in China is likely to be much larger. Um, in fact, a lot of researchers, there's two examples here. There's one from Reuters and one from, uh, sorry, that's Brookings. But there's an example here from Reuters about the fact, I think I didn't open the other one, about the fact that the Chinese population is likely overestimated. Uh, basically, somebody, uh, what's he called? Uh, uh, Fuxianzi. I think he's from Taiwan. Um, but Xi's estimates, basically what he did was he, he went to have a look at some of the numbers um, and they didn't make any sense because the admission rate in schools was lower than the stated population numbers. So three years after they were supposed to have, say, 1.6 million births, they had 1.4 million children uh, you know, registered as, as in school, yeah. um, and it didn't make any sense. And basically his estimates are that the Chinese population is probably uh, only bit, about 1.28 billion rather than 1.41 billion. Uh, the bottom paragraph yeah. there. Uh, Yi said local governments overstate their population to obtain more subsidies, yes. including education fees they collect from the central government. He said that with over 20 social benefit systems linked to a birth registration, some families are using the black market to buy second birth certificates online. There you go. <coughs> yeah, the population numbers have been inflated mainly for financial benefits, but I also think that China wants to project itself. Oh, of course. It's, it projects itself as strong and actually using its mass and scale as a symbol of strength as opposed to one of degradation. Um, China's shrinking population and constraints on its power. This is from Brookings Institute, who, who again is using the framing of raw people. It does not understand the fact that economies in the past and peoples in the past have leveraged relatively small elite populations to do relatively large amounts of uh, drastic reshaping of the world, let's say, yes. i.e. how Britain administered its empire with a comparatively low population to somewhere like India. Um, they go into a lot of the stuff here. They basically talk about the trajectory of Chinese births. They don't have any good graphics. I've got a graphic here. Um, these projections get more drastic as the lies affected it. Well, uh, you do have a quote, I believe, that's from that article. Yes. However, for the coming years and decades of the 21st century, 
demographic transition in China will constitute a major constraint in the growth of Chinese power. A working age population that peaked in 2011 at more than 900 million people will have declined by nearly a quarter to some 700 million by the century. These workers will have to provide by then for nearly 500 million Chinese aged 60 and over compared with 200 million today. America's social security system challenges seem like a policy picnic by comparison. Which is all true, but again, if you, once you factor in the fact that they've been lying about their birth rates, all of this moves up in timeline. Um, and the main problem China has is that it, it bore into, harder than anybody, the myths of managerialism, the myths of mass and scale, because they have the most mass and scale. China will be a great example of the fact that you cannot develop an economy, in quotes, with raw people. Mm. It's about who those people are. <laughs> it's, it should be the major lesson of this stream. It's that population in the abstract actually doesn't matter to no. a certain degree. And if you have 10 million people who are more capable, you know, the, the organized 10 million will beat the disorganized billion. Yep. Um, it is elite theory writ large. And as the numbers decline and all the economies that relied on the numbers, i.e. managerial economies, go into reverse, another form of governance will have to be found because it is not possible to maintain. Um, sorry. So, can we basically just sum this up as same thing is happening in India? <laughs> uh, to a lesser extent, India is on a slightly slower trajectory. But again, there are some doubts about India's population levels because it's a very poorly administered country with very, very poor uh, infrastructure and record keeping in many cases. Uh, but India may be for a short while the population, the large country that is the population driver, in quotes, that China was supposed to be, over the next decade anyway. India is trying to turn itself into a people superpower, but it's encountering the problem that China had, which is it's full of Chinamen, yeah. and India is full of Indians. <laughs> Um, and they struggle to feed their own people. Raw numbers haven't brought about the gains that were expected in this population boom era. In fact, per capita, everything has just got worse. Yeah. And as the numbers recede, and as the progress that relied on those numbers recedes with it, you will start to see dire consequences in places like India, because all of oh, this no. is interconnected. Are you telling me all the Indians are going to suffer a great misfortune? Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, a lot of them are over here now, but... Um, one of the other things to think about, too, is the fact that large amounts of the world would like some of their population back. You know, underpinning everything think tanks like Brocking say about mass immigration is the idea that power is simply an extension of popula uh, population, which is a managerialist orthodoxy. But demographic decline in the raw is only part of the picture. As Western nations' native populations age out, the diaspora of other nations um, are started to encourage to return um, on the backdrop of Western decline. We may see a syst the system built in the 20th century utterly break down and have us left with an immobile population of dregs and aging natives coupled with low-skill workers. That's like the nightmare scenario. Yeah. That basically your Britain goes into collapse. Everyone who's able to leave does leave. And you have old people and Somalians. You basically have Detroit. Um, this is the fruit of not looking to your own people in their future and instead creating an anti-human system that strips all identity from human beings. All of the Western countries fail to deliver material comfort, even more so now. A sense of belonging uh, that is uh, bereft from the West may see people migrate en masse for different reasons. Mass migration has been a disaster for nations who were seen as um, immigration sources, as it has bled them of a working age populations, populations they now want back. And as all of this goes into reverse, we may see people going, you know what, this isn't providing me material comfort. I no longer want to be here. I want to go back and be around my own people. Yes. Uh, which has ha already happened with the Polish. A lot of them have already left. It's already happening with the Romanians. A lot of those have, some of those have already been lured back. Poland is a, is a bigger success story because they've managed to have large amount of economic growth, which is, bought, which is built on relatively shaky ground, honestly, uh, but we'll not get into that right now. But yes, um, and with the debate changing around kind of nativism, as it were, with, with it being pointed out even by Labour, I know it's a fake switch in many cases, but they're still contributing the idea to the conversation 
that we just can't keep hiring brown people and expect to keep working. Um, but I don't, again, you see the different pieces of managerialism being at odds with each other here. Yep. The parts are fighting each other as the system breaks down. I've got a, just kind of a, a few conclusions here before we, uh, before we finish off here, because I, I think we've gone, over through, gone through everything we need to go through. But um, That has been a bit of a long one this evening. <laughs> yes. Sorry, there's, uh, there was more to get through than I thought. Um, do you want to read these? Or? Uh, yes, I can do. Modern living makes humans infertile. I would, for people who have not seen it, please go look at the stream we did with Philosopher Cat on Vola's Eros, because it is not the only subject that we talk about in that stream, but just the general notion, and especially Vola's descriptions, of why procreating man is incompatible with modern man cannot be stressed enough. And in a sort of roundabout way, anyone that wants to try to educate you on issues of sex, sexuality, sexual dynamics, dating, or procreation, who does not want to straight up address the fact that the environment of modernity is anti-creation, yes. is, is completely waffling and wasting your time. So please, please don't take those people seriously. Flatterly, the goals of managerialism are mutually exclusive, at least in terms of both environmentalism and also managing a population continually grows while staying healthy, whilst also keeping all the financial and social service structures existing all in one um, time they didn't, frame. They didn't leave a message, but um, thank you for the uh, the fifty pounds there um, on on through the uh, through the Ko-Fi. Um, I'll just say SP. So no, so, sorry, uh, SM. So you know who you are. But thank you very much for that. You didn't leave a message, but uh, wow, very quite a large donation uh, there. The next point you've got here is stability is key and the last century has lacked stability. I think there is a stability that they have gotten out of population, which was the hoping that it would grow at some sort of rate that would keep the economy ticking over, make sure all the old people were looked after, even though people were living in cities and in sort of social arrangements that really we still don't quite fully understand. And that clearly hasn't worked. And that has provided a sort of destabilization that our elites, clearly through everything we've looked at this evening, are clamoring to try and solve in some fashion. Whether they believe it's a good thing that it's falling, or a bad thing that it's falling, or a good thing that it's growing, or a bad thing that it's growing, any one of the four options, they at least agree there's a problem. Finally, Western populations have been deliberately suppressed and already partly replaced. We've been over that in previous streams. Um, great research already happened. What becomes the Zoomers is the main place we go through all that. We just read the numbers. Um, honestly, a lot of people seem quite alarmed by that, but we've just read the numbers and we, we interjected some of our own stuff too about the way the numbers are wrong. And I believe that a large part of the numbers we're using here will be wrong. Yes. We do not have a complete picture. We have to add our own analysis to it. But this is what we see. These are things that I believe that are inarguable yes you you can't look at the data be an honest actor and not reach these conclusions modernity makes people infertile whether that's by choice or not uh the goals of the managerial system currently are at odds with each other uh, stability is completely gone in the modern world and western populations very clearly have been discouraged from procreating yep. through uh, like psycho psychological methods and just through outright lecturing, it is both inward and, you know, subtle and loud. Inner party, outer party. One of the major projects of the 20th century has been effectively stopping white Europeans from having children. Yes. As, after the, after the post-war boom, um, that, that has been kind of the post-1960 agenda of the elite. And the idea that they can bring in easily managed, low-skilled populations to both supplements and as basically be an, an inborn colonial class, um, yep. <laughs> to, in a sense, that also is at odds with the native class to create, you know, in, a, in an almost Marxist sense, interclass conflict. Yep. Um, and it is not done through financial strata. It is done through the simple fact that these people are different than each other, and that is immutable. All of this, I think, is pretty standard, but I think we've given a relatively good wrap up of the of the situation here. Again, I would encourage people to look for incongruities in this because, honestly, 
there's a lot of conflicting information about both population sizes, population trajectories, and the sociological outcomes of what has both caused this and what this will cause. Confusion abounds. Yes. Um, we've tried to cut through it here with what we think is the most likely explanation. And confusion goes away if you add like elite theory stuff to it. If you add our perspective to it, I believe this is the least confusing explanation of what's happening, why it's happening, and what the factors are. Because, as I said, you will see it explained in all the different combinations um, that are that should be mutually exclusive. And it, we, I think it's just meant to stop people from panicking in certain ways, but also to stop people from being able to grasp the issue. Uh, we've talked about at length in previous streams about the fact that paralysis is the default position of the modern world. If you if you let the democratic systems and media systems function as they're supposed to, you get noise and you yep. get paralyzing noise. Um, and the way that the elite wield their power is by cutting through that noise and using outside of the system action that's supposed to be not allowable to the general population to essentially broker the paralysis into something that moves in their direction. That's yep. how it works. Uh, thank you, Spud Ruckus. There, thank you for for your work for the for the two uh, the two dollars. Thank you very much. Um, but what I'm getting to here really is the fact that uh, everybody's fucked. Um, possibly not. But nah, you, they are. <laughs> it's just, everybody's fucked. Good night. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, well, well. On that bombshell, um, I'm afraid I must end the show. Um, you guys have yourselves a good evening. They've listened to us enough, hasn't they? Yeah, they've so well. they've I listened to us I wouldn't want anyone. So to, I wouldn't miss to me for this long. I'll play us out. <laughs> there we go. Have have, have the end. Good night, and we'll see you on Wednesday. Good night. <laughs>